So beliefs lead to rules and expectations. Those rules and expectations lead to our behaviors. So if we're obviously unhappy about something, experience pain about something, e.g. not getting our chocolates and flowers, we are going to be behaving, displaying actions that are in line with that narrative. But if we're experiencing pleasure, of course, our behaviors and actions are very, very different. Now, what we notice in people and what we sometimes notice in ourselves if we're consciously aware of them is we notice the actions and behaviors. We don't notice the rules and we sure as hell don't notice, you know, the beliefs. What I try to do is we look at the action behaviors, reverse engineer it to get back to what the core belief is, reset, change, tweak, uh, manipulate that belief, and then you get a much different outcome. G'day everyone, Craig Rowe from People With A Passion. Thanks for joining us again. This episode is a return to our normal format. Last couple of weeks we've been sharing revisits of our most popular episodes. We've got some new interviews with some awesome guests in the can and today we're sharing the first of those. Today's guest is a transformational coach but before we go there, if you're here for the first time or you've come back again and not yet subscribed, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button and support the channel and also tap that notification bell to be advised when we have new guests interviews uploaded. So today's guest is Andrew Hackett. He's a best-selling author. Uh, he's sold multiple copies of his book, Free From Fear, and he also has a book series uh, called Fearless. He's also got a couple of podcasts and he has a masterclass, which we'll talk about a little later in the episode. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. It's good to be back interviewing the guests and we hope you enjoy this episode with our guest, Andrew Hackett. Today's episode is brought to you by Applaudable.net. Thanks, Andrew, for being here. really appreciate your time today. Thank you, mate. It's great to be here. So you're an author of multiple books around fear. So I want to start, like I do with a lot of people with a passion, is talk about your journey to becoming a transformational and transformative coach for people where did that start for you and, and why did you choose that path? So I, uh, I started my career actually as a commercial management consulting, uh, you know, consulting in between big business and big government. Part of that, I got a real buzz out of helping people and growing people and training people. Uh, I did, you know, I've worked for some of the biggest consulting agencies in Australia as well as for myself. But when I finally decided to face my pain my suffering from uh, sexual abuse that I experienced as a teenager uh, when I finally made that decision to fix myself as I call it I uh, decided to step up and part of that process of getting professional help myself was also about learning and understanding a lot about myself as everybody does I started to see that there was a bit of a process that had happened through that so I decided to document that process and I thought I wonder if I can repeat this process in others repeat the great results I had myself now look it took me 10 15 years in all honesty with you to to work it all out break it all down fully understand it all that sort of stuff and it's been particularly in the last sort of five to ten years that I've been kind of repeating that process in others and refining it further and further and further so part of the reason for getting into this work is I'm passionate about helping people and look who isn't really we all get a buzz out of it I mean mm. it, it's great fun but what I want to do though is I have always had a bit of a fundamental issue with the personal development industry and people making promises that they're not able to keep and part of the issue I mean the personal development industry has been around for 30 or 40 years right Tony Robbins really kind of pioneered it um, and brought it, let's just say, into the mainstream. But a lot of the work that people are doing in that space is focused on goal setting and action taking, and that's all good and well. That has its place, no question. But the problem is, is we're not actually fixing the underlying unconscious problems that are leading to our unhappiness. We are trying to mask them with goal setting and action taking. And I wanted to change that narrative because once you fix those things, everything else comes together. Mm -hmm. So one of your big things, because you've written a book about it, is free from fear, is yeah. this concept that, you know, uh, of fear and judgment and that those two things are probably two of the biggest barriers to us achieving happiness and anything else. So do you want to speak to, the, to, to fear? Absolutely. So one thing I started to see is that, in fact, in every moment there is 
a decision to be made, a choice to be made. Uh, we can't avoid the choice. Choice is uh, unavoidable, as is the consequence to that choice. But those choices that we made make either consciously or unconsciously are based on one or two things, and it's either based on love or it's based on fear. The problem is most of us are living a relatively unconscious life. We're not really thinking about, we're not really aware about what's actually going on within us and around us. And therefore, because we're unconscious about us, the default position, because the way our brain is wired as part of our caveman days, the default position is to make everything uh, negative in nature or fear-based. The choices we're making are then fear-based. This is exacerbated by the ego. The ego lives in this unconscious space and the ego wants us to make fear-based choices. Why? Because the ego doesn't want us making love-based choices because it disconnects us from the ego and more to the point connects us with all that is fabulous in our lives. So the big problem is, is we, we start making these fear-based decisions, these fear-based choices, and it leads us down through fear-based consequences. The problem is, is we don't check in with it. We don't bring conscious awareness to it. So we do that over a couple of years and then 10 years and then suddenly 20 years and suddenly we're 30 or 40 years into the mix and our entire life by that stage is then ruled by the consequences associated with decades of fear-based choices. Now, the exciting thing is, is we can change that. It is actually fixable and this is predominantly what I help people do. Fix those fear-based choices, that underlying egoically run narrative that controls most of our minds and you know everybody has the egoic narrative going on in our head we all do it's unavoidable however we can switch it off but we just need to be conscious about it we need to this is where presence comes into the mix this is where mindfulness comes into the mix and what i refer to as conscious connected choice is what actually helps us step forward and actually overcome those fears so we think of fear as being a fear of spiders, a fear of heights, you know, the fairly obvious with the fear of loneliness. But we've only had been born with two fears. There's only two fears that we're, we're all born with uh, and uh, all other fears are educated into us. And that is the fear of loneliness and that is the fear of heights. So the fear of heights is more about stopping us from doing daft stuff that injures us or kills us. The fear of loneliness is all about the continuity of humanity. Everything else is educated into us by, our, by the system we live in, the government, you know, our parents, our loved ones, our education system and all this sort of stuff. What is learnt can be unlearnt. And all I'm trying to do is bring people's awareness to all of this so that then we can start retracing back uh, in a therapeutic way to find where the, those seeds were laid, identify them, correct them and change them. Because once you do that, your life no longer plays out with that narrative anymore, which means goal setting, action taking, and all that other fabulous stuff, which is very effective if done properly, starts to actually change life in a positive sense, and you don't have to constantly go back and redo it all the time because once it's done, it's done. With uh, the concept of fear, uh, you also refer to judgment. So when you refer to judgment and you've linked that to ego, do you want to explain what that association is? So all things that are negative in our life experience are constructed of fear judgment is one of them now the funny thing is is the ego is very very smart and relentless as well it knows that judgment disconnects remember the whole point of the the egos and the whole job the ego has is to implement fears work because fear is part of our physical life experience that we came here to experience we chose to experience this it knows that judgment disconnects because it just wants to disconnect you because it knows that it becomes irrelevant if you become connected with others. So whether it's your judgment of other people, and this is what this narrative is. I call it the squawky parrot, sits on your shoulder, constantly talks trash in your ear. We all have one, but it has women judging women because they're fat, the way they're dressed, the way their hair is. If a woman's, God forbid, overly confident, women will judge that too. Men are exactly the same, but we cut men down for being successful and for being strong we even judge other men and that if they're relaxed and mindful and at peace you know judgment is educated into us as well you know society judges us if we're not judging people mm. so the, the simple fact of the matter remains judgment only poisons the person who is doing the judging most of the time the person receiving the judgment 
doesn't care what you've got to think, doesn't even really know sometimes the judgment's going on because it's so commonplace and it certainly doesn't affect them the way we would want it to. The simple fact of the matter is we need to move forward from judgments. We need to pull that back. We need to realise the poisoning and the toxins that build up in our system or in our mind as a result of that judgment and we need to stop doing it because once we do, our life changes fundamentally. It's uh, interesting because I know in the last three years you've hit on two things. Um, you talk about our programming over the period of decades and things like that. And I had some experiences that forced me to look at myself and my programming. And one of the things I identify, one of my hugest failings is judgment, that I sit in judgment of others all the time, whether it be internally or even externally, where I've called people out, even in just private conversations. And I realise that process actually doesn't work. Because like you say, they don't necessarily agree with you or, or believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and look, you know, judgment's one of those funny things. You're right. We shouldn't be thinking about what other people are thinking about us because one, it's the one thing we can't control. And any thought someone is having about us isn't about us at all. It's actually always about them. But the, the, the fascinating thing about judgment is, you know, judgment is this big curse that we have. And ultimately speaking, we need to move on from this judgment what are we doing when we're judging? We're judging people for being different to us, having different thoughts, different theories, different beliefs, look differently. Uh, they act differently. God forbid they choose differently. The funny thing is we're all designed to be different. That's a simple fact. If we were all the same, life would be boring. And we need to start embracing the fact that we're supposed to be different and start seeing the opportunities and strengths that come from those differences rather than judging them because they're different to ours. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, a really important thing that, audience should sort of learn early is that it goes both ways judgment is your judgment of others and then how you approach when you feel you're being judged and how that you can then take action um, on that basis so I want to talk about a little bit about uh, change so you talk about choice and how you yeah. change because you're a transformational uh, coach so yeah. how do we bring about change when we've been programmed for so long what are some of the strategies Absolutely. So there's a number of things associated with change. First of all, it's the realisation that not only do we have a choice in every single given moment, because most of us have been programmed to believe we don't have choices. Um, worse still, we're also programmed to believe the choices that we make actually take away our future choices, which of course is madness in itself. So once we realise we have a choice, then the opportunity for change comes about. Now, what I try to do is I try to talk to people about this, what I refer to as the love and fear dichotomy, that in every moment, every thought, every feeling, every choice we make is either based on either love or fear. The benefit of understanding that is depending on which you choose also determines the, what the outcome is constructed of. So when we start looking at change, you know, most of my work, honestly, is done between, uh, most of my work is done with females. Uh, so my clientele are mostly females, uh, usually in the age between 40 to 45 and 60 plus. Now, the interesting thing about my demographic is that, and the reason why it's mostly female and reason why it's mostly in that age bracket is because most women have dedicated their lives to their family, to their kids, to their husbands, sometimes to their jobs, and they get into their mid 40s. They start to experience what we crudely refer to as a bit of a midlife crisis. And all a midlife crisis is, is their current life expectations are now different to the belief system they set up 20 odd years ago, right? Men go through exactly the same mm. thing. Uh, men tend to do it a little bit more outwardly expressionate, like buy fancy cars, but women do it in a, a more internally empowering way. So they start to say, well, you know what? Now's my time. I've given my life to this. Now's my time, but I don't know how to get started. So they reach out to transformational trainers like myself to uh, build up their confidence to uh, sort out all of the issues that have happened in the past and, and set everything up with them so that they can then move forward in a beautiful way. This type of change for a lot of people is very confronting. And in fact, it's downright scary because the older we get, despite the fact we've got more practice at living, the older we get, the more unsure we become about simple things. I mean, how many old people have you met that sit back and go, Oh, I don't want to go out on the dating scene or I don't want to go out and socialise or, wow, I haven't started a new job in a long time or, you know, I haven't got the skill sets that I once had. You know what? You've got more skill sets now. You just need to believe in yourself a little bit more and stop listening to, to the egoic narrative that's going on. 
once we start to formulate an approach forward, and a lot of this is about focusing on what are they passionate about, um, what particular skills they do have, and how can we combine both of them to create something that is meaningful to them? And the reason why they're both important is because one is about utilizing already existing strengths and the other one is about passion. And as you would probably know, when you're passionate about something, it, it, one, it doesn't really feel like that much of a job and two, you're a lot better at it as well. So when we start looking at that change, we wanna try and formulate something that is broadly referred to as purpose, this life purpose that we have. Now, why is life purpose really, really important? Well, it's important because anybody who is following their life purpose, anybody who knows what it is and is taking action on it, you cannot be depressed. You cannot be unhappy. You are invigorated. You feel alive again, sometimes for the first time in 20 years. Now, the problem with all of this is often people that get to this particular stage and they start to wake up, they start to grow at a quite an accelerated rate, particularly if they've got a, a seasoned, trained uh, practitioner to help them along with the process, right? And that's kind of what you're paying for. You're paying for that accelerated growth to learn in a period of three to six months what took someone else 10 years to figure out. And they've just refined it and refined it until it works for everybody. When they start to move forward with that, there's a whole range of other complications that come about. So relationships start to fall apart because they're growing at a rate and the person they're in a relationship isn't, particularly if they're workplace related relationships. It can get claws out, it can get other egos engaged, people can come on the attack. And there's all those things that sometimes having a good practitioner on board that understands how it all works can then help guide them through all of that, stop them from making costly mistakes and more to the point, stop them from wasting precious time and to help them move forward in a very positive way. And change itself can be scary for everybody. But if you are committed, if you are determined, if you are focused, you are the decision maker on what happens for your future. That is a simple fact. The universe doesn't decide. People talk about roadblocks. You know, I tried to do something and the universe put this roadblock in the way and, you know, the universe was telling me it shouldn't. It, it's not supposed to happen. You know what, I say, I call the rubbish on that. The universe doesn't have a choice in the matter. The universe is there to reflect back to you what you are putting out through your energy, your decisions, your choices, whatever you want to call it. The universe isn't saying you shouldn't do that. The universe is asking a question and the question is all important because the universe is actually asking how badly do you want this? Mm -hmm. Because if you then push through that roadblock, there may be another roadblock, but the roadblocks soon disappear because the universe gets more and more confirmation Yep, they have definitely decided that this is their future path. Okay, let's get on and help them make it happen. And that's when doors start to open. That's when momentum starts to build. And that's when overnight successes that can sometimes take ten to you know five to ten years, that's when the overnight success is actually recognised and seen. Mm. It's interesting. I had some experience, which I shared with you off camera, and one of the things I found is there was barriers being thrown up left right and center you know and i had this saying and i said you're not breaking me you're making me because i just find a different way around the barriers that were thrown up so it's a matter of yeah. mindset and attitude when it comes to understanding it still comes down to choice it's it's whether you choose to accept that there's a barrier there absolutely and look you know one of the biggest choices i see that is available to everyone that most people have no idea is there and that is the choice to see problems as opportunities. We often, you know, we're trained over years and years, indoctrinated into this belief system that a problem presents and problems exist. You know what? Problems are all made up by our minds. If you are present, if you are mindful, are you in that space? Problems can't exist, which means they never existed in the first place. Hmm. So I try to change people's thinking through the sign of these seeds. It's not a problem. You're looking at it all wrong. It's in fact an opportunity, not necessarily for exploitation, but an opportunity for growth at the very, very least. And when people start seeing problems as opportunities, that impactless them every time they come about, it doesn't shut, shut them down anymore. It, it gets to a point where you almost want the barriers there, I must say. I know that sounds silly. It's almost counterintuitive because it makes you yeah. think differently and challenge you. And when things get quiet, you start to think, well, what's going on? <laughs> it's, it's like you, you become more comfortable with the, the constantly being challenged. So it's almost like a, uh, I, I spoke with 
um, Brandon Steiner, who is an entrepreneur in the US, who talks about the hostile mindset. And he also talks about the underdog mindset. And it's interesting with the on- underdog mindset, they're always, lo- you know, got this attitude that they've got to, they're losing. So therefore, they, they, they're not happy with the status quo. They've got to be winners all the time. And then obviously your hostile mindset is where you want to prove to, not so much to people, but when you achieve something, you remember those that said you couldn't do it. So that's that hostile sort of approach to understanding, you know, what you're doing. So barriers do do that, whether it be your own barrier or, or something that is perceived to have been put up by someone, someone else. I want to talk about, you touched on purpose there a little bit, and I want to talk about passion because one of the things that people have in their life is they put things in their lives to distract them, whether it be alcohol, drugs, things like that. Now, one of the things I've found when I speak with people around passion is that some people use passion as a form of escapism. And and do you feel that sometimes passion, while I see it as passion is important and purpose is equally as important, they more or less go hand in hand, do you think that passion can be a bad thing? And in what instances? Yeah, look, that's a fabulous question, mate, and I really appreciate you asking it because, you know, for 20 odd years, I lived with my head in a bottle dealing with the sexual abuse that I experienced as a teenager. And ultimately speaking, I was looking for answers at the bottom of the bottle. And of course, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out there are no answers to be found there. But I locked myself into many different passions. And one of it was developing and growing big gardens. Right. It's just it was something I did in my part time. It was part of my creative expression. The problem is it also destroyed my first marriage because I spent all my time focused on if I wasn't at work, you know, earning the dollars and stuff. And that was always just a justifiable excuse in my mind at the time. If I wasn't there, I was out in the garden doing stuff. Um, And when one garden was complete, I'd sell that house and buy another one and then go and build a bigger one. Ultimately speaking, all addictive behaviors are driven by a need to disconnect from our perceived problems, whether it's guilt or shame, like it was for me, or whether it's a whole range of other things. Um, We often use passionate activities, things we are passionate about, to also distract us. A lot of people are passionate about sports. A lot of people are passionate about work. A lot of people are passionate about some of their hobbies. Some people are passionate about their cats. You know, everybody's different. But this is where conscious connected choice comes in. This is where the need to be consciously aware and present comes in. Because when we are, we suddenly start to see things for the reality that they are. And ultimately speaking, escapism is escapism, whether you're using drugs, alcohol, food is another big one for you. I mean, we all emotionally regulate with food. Food, I'm I'm really guilty at doing that. I love my food. Um, But even things like uh, our hobbies and our jobs and stuff, what we're actually trying to escape from is the fear surrounded the social aspect with connection because we've become disconnected we're constantly looking at our phones all of the time constantly trying to be disconnected and what we're disconnecting from is we're disconnecting from this egoic narrative this bullshit story that's going on in our heads all of the time that we feel like we can't control uh, and we're, we're told actually it's it's us that's doing all of that when in fact we're actually the the individual listening to that, observing that. And that distinction is really, really, really important. But again, to get to your question, you're right, we all do it at one point or another. Uh, I think it's when we don't have things to distract us and then we suddenly have to sit in this voice and we're not consciously aware of what's going on. That's when things like mental illness, that's when things like depression and anxiety start to really get a hold. If we can bring conscious awareness to it all. And this is why, you know, my first book in the Fearless series is called Ending Your Unconsciousness because it talks about how to overcome this mind-based narrative, what you need to think about to become consciously aware of it. Uh, and then the Fearless series goes on through a number of books, one, Awakening to Your Truth, which is part of that process of awakening, both in the initial awareness of awakening plus the discovery phase, and then we we talk about the other phases associated with connection and selflessness. Um, And then we can get into manifesting, then we can get into success, then we can get into the creation process, which is goal setting and action oriented, uh, action taking, all that sort of stuff as well. So we've covered a lot of stuff there. One thing I want to touch base on, because of how much we've covered is this concept of you know your beliefs 
your values and then also finding your own truth and what does that mean because one thing i've identified is that perspective is the foundation of all and i put it in brackets your truth so do you want to speak a little bit around truth and and how we all have a different truth absolutely so the best way to describe that is that we all have a lens right and i i picture it like a big lens sitting in front of us almost like we're looking through a set of goggles right uh, like scuba diving mask or something like that this lens is formed over our life experience from all the good times all the bad times all the traumas you know the bullying all of the, that sort of stuff everybody's past life experience is very different different parents different educations different locations cultures systems governments you name it right this is why when you get 10 people observing the same event you get 10 different perspectives some of them will be a positive very few of them most of them will be negative what we need to do is we need to observe this lens because we not only observe the world through this lens but we also project our thoughts and feelings and our words through it as well to the outside world which means if you've got someone that has been that is highly anxious depressed suffering from a mental illness uh, dealt with things like uh, sexual abuse, domestic violence, all this sort of stuff. Obviously, their interpretation of world-based events will be heavily clouded around a fear-based narrative. Okay, and you know what? Fair enough, because that's some really tough stuff to deal with. There's no judgment there; it's just an observation. Uh, whereas, if you've got someone, let's talk it, Tony Robbins, for instance, you know, the guy's the master of positive transformation. He looks at everything like an opportunity because he shaped that lens. Now, the interesting thing is, is we can grab that lens and we can throw it away and we can start and recreate a completely new lens. It takes a little bit of time. It takes a lot of commitment, a lot of focus and certainly a lot of determination. But with the right practitioner, again, you can recreate that lens so that everything that you experience is filtered then through that lens and everything you project is also filtered through that lens. And this is where beliefs, rules and behaviours come into play. Our core belief system, first formulated when we we're very young by our parents, when we we're li wee little tots, then we start stepping into our teenagers. It starts to be influenced by siblings and people we look up to and, you know, rock bands and celebrities and influencers, God help us. Then we get into our 20s and we want to break free completely of our parents' influence and create our own. Now, the problem is, is we then don't check in with our beliefs for another 20 or 30 years until we start to experience our midlife crisis and realise the 20-year-old beliefs are no longer relevant in our 40s. Now, the problem is, is these beliefs create rules. All our rules are, are expectations. And one example I give, let's talk about Valentine's Day. If I've got a partner in my life and on Valentine's Day, I have an expectation that uh, she will give me chocolates and maybe buy me flowers, maybe even take me out to dinner, right? If that's my expectation and she does it, I experience pleasure. If she doesn't though, I experience pain. They call it the pleasure and pain dichotomy. Now, the interesting thing is, is she may not be aware of my expectations or the rules that I have given that particular scenario. So all of the work that I do in counseling couples, it always comes back down to this. And this is what I primarily do. And, you know, looking at my passion and looking at my skill set. My skill set over the years was about grabbing highly complex and technical things and making them very simple to understand so everybody can clearly understand them at the same level. And so when we get this pleasure and pain dichotomy, the, 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 the couples over a period of time, particularly over 10, 15 years, both of their rules and expectations change, but they don't communicate them. So they have no idea what their rules and expectations are between them. So then what ultimately happens is they become disconnected and disjointed. Just by sitting down and explaining the way this works and getting them to explain what their rules and expectations are, are, at least then helps them understand how they grew apart and why they're different on, on this particular issue. So the thing is, is those rules and behaviours, so beliefs lead to rules and expectations, those rules and expectations lead to our behaviours. So if we're obviously unhappy about something, experience pain about something, e.g. not getting our chocolates and flowers, we are going to be behaving displaying actions that are in line with that narrative. But if we're experiencing pleasure, of course, our behaviours and actions are very, very different. Now, what we notice in people and what we sometimes notice in ourselves if we're consciously aware of them is we notice the actions and behaviours. We don't notice the rules and we sure as hell don't notice, you know, the beliefs. What I try to do is we look at the action behaviours, reverse engineer it to get back to what the core belief is. 
reset, change, tweak, uh, manipulate that belief, and then you get a much different outcome. So one big example, I once had a belief, and it's a very common belief that a lot of people have, that everybody should act in a certain way, right? Common law mm. dictates it. Uh, churches say within governments tell us we have to do certain things in a certain way. My belief was in line with that. The problem was is when people did something that was outside of that particular rule of what they should do given that particular circumstance, I would get angry and frustrated at it. Now, the problem is it's not affecting anybody else but me. So it was leading me to be unhappy, leading me to be, uh, you know, angry all the time. So I then had to sit back and go, right, my actions being displayed is not representative of who I want to be represented as, e.g. because I was being angry and frustrated. What's the cause? Well, what is my expectation? Well, my expectation is they do this. And I started to think, oh, that's because I've got a belief that says that they should behave in a certain way. So I just changed the belief. So now I have a belief that people can act, think and do whatever they damn well please. It's their right to believe what they want. It's their right to think however they want to think. We can't take that right. I've got no right to say that they do have any other right but that. So suddenly everything everybody does around me doesn't irritate me or bother me in remotely the slightest because they've got a right to do it. I may not agree with it. I may not even really understand it, but I can certainly respect their right to believe what they want, to think how they want to think, and even, to a degree, act how they want to act. So thanks for sharing that. That's a really good explanation. So I appreciate that. There'd be a lot of people, I think, who uh, in relationships where they've been together for a long time, where they're going to question how they approach their expectations around what is happening or isn't happening within their relationships and maybe that they might go grab your book or book series let's talk a little bit about our current situation in the world what are the sort of challenges you think people are going to be facing uh, moving forward and and is this a good time for them to be retrospective and having a look at their lives and what value do some of the things you're talking about actually bring moving forward, given that the world's not going to be as normal, that there's going to be a new normal? Yeah, look, I think that's actually a really good question. And again, I think it comes back to the fear of change. I think a lot of people were fearful because of the changes that need to be implemented. I mean, our actual contact rate with the virus itself, albeit scary, and certainly the media was beating it all up, no question. Our contact rate was very, very low. And... I know in some some countries it did certainly get scary, but I just want to look at the opportunity that can be found in this moment for everybody involved, is we suddenly have an opportunity where a lot of people that normally wouldn't embrace technologies like this to communicate, to work together and all that sort of stuff, they are now embracing it. That in itself is a change and a fear-based change that uh, a lot of people have embraced. So you're already proving to yourself that you can in fact implement change, even if you're kind of forced into it. What I want to do is I want to open up the thoughts of possibility around all of this is uh, a lot of things, you know, for a guy like myself who's been working from home for some 10 or 15 years now, a lot of big businesses are now starting to embrace the idea of enabling people to work from home and they're actually getting quite positive results, which is fabulous. Again, it's just highlighting a particular change that's happening. Ultimately speaking, all change can bring positive results if you approach it in the right way, particularly also if you get the right type of help. Don't be afraid of change. Change is inevitable. It is the only constant, in fact, in the universe, and that is change. So we need to try and embrace this. I work with people up to the age of, you know, I think 89 was or 92 was my oldest client. And, you know, my hat really goes off to them because the big issue around change is dealing with hab habits, dealing with this habitual programming that's happened. Now, for someone who is in their early 20s, and I even work with teenagers as well, uh, and the beautiful thing about working with teenagers is they adapt to change incredibly fast, which is fabulous. It's not that they do it any faster than anybody else. It's just that they're more practised at it. People that are in their 30s and 40s and stuff like that often have a whole range of habits or what I call uh, negative behavioural baselines that they have got programmed into themselves that they've forgotten about because they're, they're, they're unconscious. What I say is we all know it takes three weeks to create a habit or more to the point, 
also three weeks to reprogram an old negative habit into a more positive one. But what a lot of people don't know, if we then grab that three week habit and we continue that same positive behavior for three months, is it programs it into our unconscious aspect and it's like driving a vehicle it becomes an autopilot activity where we don't think about the pedal or the steering wheel or anything like that we just drive right we pedal brake pedal brake how many times we've got no idea because we're unconscious to it but it's a positive behavioral baseline that we've created this is what this is the massive difference between the five percent of the people in the world that are successful and the 95 percent of the people in the world who are struggling to find success is successful people they identify, they become consciously aware of something within them that they need to improve or work on. They find someone who's an expert in that field. They pay that expert to teach them in three to six months what that expert took 10 to 15 years to learn, right? They do that, they master it, they practice it until it becomes a positive behavioral baseline and then they go and find something else. And yes, you it costs money. You've got to spend money to do it because people need to get paid for the advice that they're giving. But I'm telling you right now, this is what separates successful people. It's what I talk about in my next upcoming book of the Fearless series, Accepting Your Success, is that success can be taught and it can be learnt. What is often different is people's attitudes towards learning something new, changing, making the changes that they need to make. Don't be afraid of change. Change can be a wonderfully uplifting and exhilarating experience. You just need to find the right person to help you. And look, if someone, for instance, wants to start their own podcast show, for instance, they might reach out to someone like you who has got a bit of a program together and everything like that so that they can move forward. But once they've learned that skill, they then might want to go, well, how do I become an expert interviewer? Maybe they need to find someone who teaches that. You know, a lot of us have our masterclasses. My particular masterclass is to help people get started from their unhappy, unfulfilled life and break them free into a life of potential and abundance, right? That's what my masterclass ultimately teaches. It gives a very different perspective. It talks about the importance of working on the mind, the body, and the spirit. But all of these things are also very, very important. But if people don't want to change, the change is not possible. They have to make a choice within themselves that I want to change. They have to know why they want to change because that spurs them on. And then they need to actually take action. And mostly action in the first point is engaging someone to actually help them with, with that process. You can take 10 years to do it. That's completely your choice. You can do whatever you want to do, and I'll always respect that. But what if I was to tell you I could teach you 10 to 15 years of staff within a three to six month period, and from that, then you can go on and start changing the world in your own way. I reckon most people will see that not only as great value, but they'll see that as a great opportunity for them to implement the change that they want in their life. And more to the point, good change, the adoption of change, the practice of change, that's where real freedom comes from. Mm. I really, that really speaks to me where I'm at right now because I'm having a lot of people connect with me uh, around podcasting, having seen what I'm doing, particularly live streaming as well. And uh, I'm running a course later in the year. So I have a journalism background, so I'll be focusing on the interview techniques as well as the technical side of it but also I've run businesses for a long time and I've had people and friends who because they've become unemployed they're actually uh, being forced into their own businesses and because they haven't done it before they're actually paying me even though I don't know what to cost it out at um, they're giving me a budget and saying look we want this much advice so so I understand what you're saying around you know that concept of fast tracking people's learning and having a mentor there and, and, you know, I've seen it, like I had an IT in a business for 12 years and I'd go in to repair a machine or something and I'd, it'd take me five to 10 minutes and I'd charge them X amount of dollars and the, the person would go, oh, but it only took you 10 to 15 minutes. And I said, how long were you trying to fix it? They go, two hours. And I go, yeah, you're paying for my knowledge. So that's, that's what people have to understand is it might have taken me years to to be able to fix that in five minutes or 10 minutes because i can identify yeah. the problem straight away so yeah that's what you pay for when you're paying for the coaching and things like that so you've got your book series and everything like that and you also have a master class actually so for those that may be looking for change in their life uh given you are a transformational coach uh what do they need to do or where can they go i'll make sure i'll link in our description your masterclass, but explain what the masterclass is. Okay, so the masterclass in itself was developed because 
I suppose anybody who understands the way um, business works, you know, I'm, I'm an individual. I can't help absolutely everybody, although I did make a commitment to not leave anybody behind. So I provide a range of services, some of them free, and people can get my stuff on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and all that sort of stuff. And people are getting good results just from that sort of stuff. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a way that was scalable so uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people can get started. And that's what the masterclass is all about. So the masterclass is actually broken up in two things. There's the basic masterclass, which is just an online um, event that I held uh, where I, I talk about what they need to know to get started. The premium masterclass also has uh, an online course, which is 30 lessons, nine exercises, and it, it steps them through the process on how to get started. It is a, a really good and highly formulated overview. Now, the reason why I did that is because, again, I can't help the thousands of people that contact me, but I can point them to the masterclass and say, if you're really serious about this, go and do the masterclass. The benefit of the masterclass is it also gets them some accelerator calls, or what I call a five call accelerator program, where I get on the phone with them through a video call similar to this, and we work through each of the things to contextualize it in their own experience. Because a lot of people that want to make the change are not able to impartially sit outside that and intuitively understand how it applies to them. And that's where I come in. And that way, the vast majority of people in five quick sessions uh, end up by getting extraordinary results in changing their life and they're off, they're doing the thing. Some people then wanna take it further. They wanna go, well, if, if we can achieve that in five sessions, imagine what we can achieve with three or six or 12 months coaching. And then we we just move forward on a, on a re, you know, reduced coaching plan associated with weekly calls and all that sort of stuff. And then we can properly tailor it to them ongoing. So that's, that's what the whole purpose of the masterclass, just so that, uh, because I've only got a limited number of hours in the day, I've still got more books to write. I've got, you know, corporate clients as well that I need to uh, manage and deliver for. Uh, and that way people can uh, do all of those as well. And, uh, and it means everybody can get started in their own time. Uh, Andrew Hackett, I really do appreciate your time today. You've given us a wealth of information for people who are interested. Make sure you go up and check the website. I'll put the descriptions in there for the masterclass, uh, the links for your socials and everything like that. But I really do appreciate you sharing your knowledge today and didn't charge any of us yet. <laughs> it's all good, mate. It's all good. Look, happy to help out where I can. You know, we all want to help everybody in the way that we can. I'm just glad I had the time and everything to sit with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your listeners. Thanks, mate. Take care. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to comment. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be advised of new interviews when they're uploaded. I hope you join us again sometime. Catch you later.